It's possible for me to cover all the ground in just one hour. So I shall concentrate largely on the evidence we have, both physical and cultural, that establishes the connection between Egyptian and American cultures in a very early period, a period about 800 years before Christ. But before I go on to focus on my subject, I want to make you aware of the fact that I am not the first to suggest that there were Africans in America before Columbus. Columbus was the first to suggest it. <laughs> On his second voyage, Columbus noted in his journal and reported that the natives of Española, as it was then known, it's now Haiti, Santo Domingo, came to him and told him that blacks, black people, had come from the south and southeast, trading with them in gold-tipped metal spears. They had come in large boats. Columbus was skeptical, and he sent two samples of these boats to Spain, two samples of these spears, sorry, to Spain to be assayed. They were examined and assayed in Spain, and they were found to have the identical ratio of gold, silver, and copper alloys as metal spears then being forged in African Guinea. The Portuguese were in Guinea since around 1450 when in fact they were attacked by one of the African navies. There was a fight in the Gambia. And the Portuguese had built a fort there, which Columbus, when Columbus's first visit to Africa was in 1484, quite a while before he came to America, he had been at that fort. In fact, he had tried to persuade the Portuguese to finance him to make his trip across the ocean. And the Portuguese had told Columbus on his return from his first voyage that they were aware of Africans leaving the Cape Verde Islands, which is just off Guinea, and going far to the west with merchandise. Now, in this, we have, first of all, the oral tradition of the Native Americans who said that there were black people trading with them in these gold-tipped metal spears. We have the diaries of Columbus stating this, recording this. We have the Portuguese making records of Africans leaving in large boats from the Cape Verde and going far to the west with merchandise. We have the metallurgical evidence in Spain that these trade items, which were supposed to be West African, had been examined and found to be West African. And then on top of that, we have the linguistic evidence, which came later from Leo Wiener, who started work in this field in the 1920s, African, the Discovery of America, three volumes. And in it, he points out that the word guanin, which the Indians were using, the Native Americans, that is, were using for this, these gold-tipped metal spears, came from kwani, which is the word gold, in many of the West African languages along that Atlantic coast. And we have, in addition to that, botanical evidence of a connection because they have found a species of cotton in the Cape Verde Islands from which the blacks were coming in their trade with the Native Americans in the Caribbean. They found a species of cotton 30 years before the coming of Columbus. Europeans settling in the Cape Verde Islands took a cotton from Africa which they thought was African from the African Atlantic coast and planted it into the Cape Verde and it was found to be Gossipium hirsutum var punctatum, which is not African. In other words, they must have got it. It was an American cotton that grows in the Caribbean and parts of South America. They must have got it from here and brought it back. But not only in this trade, there seem to be things brought over, like the guanin, and there is another item, the almezar, which Columbus's men saw in South America, though Columbus himself did not set foot on South America. On his third voyage, the, the men from his ship went into South America, though he did not come off the ship. And there are things that have come from America, not only the cotton, they have found maize, maize, American maize in pre-Columbian strata in Africa. They've even find, found the pineapple at Pompeii. Well, I, I'm not going to go into that because that doesn't particularly concern us. That could remain a riddle, but there is no riddle about the maize. It is clearly distinguishable from African sorghum 
There is no riddle about the cotton that is a very distinctive cotton that is American. So there was a trade in that period at least 50 years before Columbus. My concern, however, is not with the late pre-Columbian period, but with contacts made by Africans in a very, very early period, long, long before Columbus was a twinkle. And we have very hard evidence of this connection and contact. It was about a hundred years ago, and by the way, let me say something about the history of this subject because people are very confused about so many things. And one of the problems we have in the recovery of African history is that most people think that anything that is said has equal weight with anything else. So that if someone said that when the continents were joined, Africans came across to America, and if someone said there was a lost city of Atlantis in the Atlantic, Plato said so, and that is how they came. Many people think that because it's in favor of the thesis, it helps the thesis, it does not. It certainly does not. That there is absolutely no hard evidence for Atlantis at the moment, none whatsoever. The Russians believe it's in the Straits of Gibraltar. Henrietta Mark, Mark believes it's in Mississippi. Some people believe it's off South America. Some people think it's in the middle of the Atlantic. Some people think it's in, the Bermuda, in Bermuda where they're having trouble with lost planes and ships. Some people think it's a space station. It has nothing to do with hard archaeology. Just let's forget it. One of these days, if they find it, we will talk about it. <laughs> And the same thing is true of the continents being joined. That's absolute rubbish. When the continents were joined, there were no human beings on earth. That is a far, far geological time, long before the appearance of Homo sapiens. That has absolutely nothing to do with this. We have got to be very careful in the presentation and in the examination and exploration of these subjects to be extremely cautious, even to the point where evidence is presented as the thesis which you have to reject. Let me give you an example. Ramesses II developed an infection of his leg. How marvelous that Africans are years after when one develops an infection in the leg, it causes a stir. They had to go and see how they could stop this infection. And when they opened up his belly, they found in the wrappings in his belly, they found tobacco. Now that is extraordinary because people have insisted, most scientists have insisted that tobacco comes from America. How on earth did it get in the belly of Ramesses II? Now that would appear to, to help my thesis. It does not. Because first of all, I have pointed out in my book that there were two types of tobacco. The Africans had their own tobacco and Americans had their own tobacco. And that even without contact, that tobacco could have got into Ramesses the second belly because nobody has taken the courage yet to test the tobacco to see if it is truly American. It may turn out to be African in origin. I pointed out that the word tobacco is not used at all in America for the plant. No American tribe uses tobacco for the tobacco plant. They use tobacco for the pipe. They used tobacco for the act of smoking, which was alien to them. As Schweinfurt has pointed out in the heart of Africa, that the Africans devised more ingenious contrivances for smoking, which, is, which was new to the American, only tactics the Indian chief smoked. That was a late development in history because people did not use tobacco for smoking, neither the Africans nor the Americans. Tobacco was used as a medicine it could be chewed, it could be used to create a smoke and the smoke was, was pushed through the nose or through the, through the mouth or through the anus or through the vagina to an orifice in the body in order to clean out and soothe the affected parts of the body. So smoking is a recent invention and we have evidence to suggest that it developed in Africa and the reason why the Americans were using smoke words, not just Tabaco and the Tawa, Taba words, but even Juli, Jemba, a whole range of smoke words from Africa find their way through South American Patro, and they are not Mexican words at all. They're not Mexican in origin at all. They're not South American in origin. 
The reason I go back to the early period, although I'm going to be dealing, the reason why I go back to the 1450, 1492 period is, although I'll be dealing with the later periods, to make you aware how is it that history can actually be documented and yet lost. A lot of African history actually exists in documents. It is not true that all the documents are lost, but they are fragmented and scattered, and when they appear, they are dismissed. When Columbus mentions black people, he actually, on his third voyage, goes to Africa, follows the coastline of Africa, goes into the Cape Verde searching for black cattle, which both the West Africans and the Americans in Caribbean were using for sacrifice and for ritual purposes, doesn't find any black cattle, proceeds down into the very current that the Africans used to cross to America, and comes to America in half the time by using the African current. And then lands on South, lands first in Trinidad, he calls it Trinidad because he see, saw three rocks which reminded him of the Holy Trinity, very sacred man. <laughs> and then he comes the next day to South America and he does not come off the ship. Columbus, note this, note this, Columbus never once set his foot on the American continent, never once. He wandered into the Caribbean on all his voyages. On the third voyage, although he came to South America, he would not come off the ship. He said he had an arthritic fit. It's the same thing happening when he was in the Caribbean. When King Ferdinand sent a letter to him, when they found out a man appeared in the court, Jaime Ferreira pointed out that he had learned from Africans and Arabs in Africa that there was a land to the south, this is South America, there was a landmass to the south and it was on the same latitude of Guinea just below the equinoctial line and that Africans had been there and that they were aware of exactly how far away it was. The, the Portuguese knew that from African intelligence, they knew that it was about 15 to 1600 miles. That is why even before Europeans came to South America, they ran a, a line across the world in June. 1494, even before Cabral came here in 1500, there was a line drawn across the world so that the Portuguese could have that land mass. That's why the Portuguese owned Brazil. That's even before they came, you know. Even before they're supposed to have come, the line is drawn on African intelligence. And Jaime Ferrar goes and tells the, the Spanish court that Columbus knows about it. He had discussions with the Portuguese and he had made a deal with the Portuguese not to let the Spanish know. That's why when Columbus came back on his second voyage and he hoped to go back to the Caribbean to colonize it further, the Spanish said, no, I want you to go now into the south. I want you to check out the south. There is a landmass in the south. And Columbus said, no, there could be no landmass within this demarcation line the Portuguese are asking for because they said it's 370 leagues, which is about four and a half miles, according to Vespucci, and there could be no land within that space because I have traveled twice as many leagues and I have found no such land, which is partly true because Europe is twice as far from America as is Africa. And when he comes to South America, he does not come off the ship purposely, just like when he got the letter in Cuba, he said, I am in Cuba. They told him, come home immediately. We want to know about this line. We want to know if the Portuguese ambassadors are cheating us. He says, I am in Cuba. Listen to this. I am in Cuba. I am too gravely ill to move. I cannot come home. And I am certain that Cuba is the continent because my ships cannot circumnavigate it. Now he wrote, I found the letter he wrote six months earlier to Luis Santagel. Chancellor of Aragon saying, I am certain that Cuba is an island, for the natives who have lived there for centuries have told me so. They knew it was an island. Why is he writing the Spanish to say it's the continent? And when he comes to South America, does, not, does he not come off the ship, but he sends a letter home saying that South America is an island. This is the greatest navigator to whom we owe our discovery. <laughs> There's a vast amount, even in the documented area, there's a vast amount of lying and trickery and treachery. That is why on the fourth voyage, Columbus was arrested by Bobadilla. He was taken back like a black. He and his brother Bartholomew were taken back in the hold of the ship 
and brought the trial in Spain. How many of you know that? And he's taken back for trial and at the trial all of these things come out that he had because he had got up like his brother by marrying a Portuguese woman of high birth. That is how he had meant, managed to enter the courts of Portugal and Spain and elsewhere. And he had got involved with the Portuguese and he had decided that his left hand would be filled with Portuguese money and his right hand with Spanish money and he would keep, allow the Portuguese to move into the south and keep the Spanish in the north. I do not have time to go into that. I'll go into that in greater detail in question time. Let me come to the meat of the subject which deals with the Olmec, O-L-M-E-C. It was a hundred years ago in 1858 that some peasants of trust supporters discovered a huge stone head. Now I want the slides to go on so you can see the area I'm talking about. And when I speak of Mexico, please understand, I'm not talking of the shrunken Mexico of today. I'm speaking of Mexico when it was the center of the American continent, at least the North American continent, when it stretched as far as La Plata in Canada, when it included parts of Texas, California, Colorado, etc. So that when one speaks of it, don't just push it off the map and say Central America, it was America. It was the center of the first American civilization. Now let us have the first slide. There you see the area I'm speaking about. In that diamond or basin, that, that basin where you see those little diamonds, those little black diamonds, there is where at La Venta, on this side, at Trasaportes and at San Lorenzo, they found a number of huge stone heads. But the first head was found in 1858, and I want to show you what they saw in 1858, more than a century ago. Next. This is the head. This head was dug out of the earth in 1858, and I, this is the face. Let us look at the side. This is the side. Let us look at the back, and note now the back. Do you know that this photograph has never been published in any book, not even in mine? Do you know two young black anthro-photo journalists, Wayne Chandler and Catherine Gaynell, showed me this last year? It blew my mind. <laughs> this photograph is hidden in the files, hidden in the posthumous files of Heiser. It's a photograph showing you what the head looked like when they found it. Yet the National Geographic, which is so remarkable for authentic presentation of what it finds, did not think it necessary to show these braids. The Mexicans then started to talk about Africans in America before Columbus, Jose Melgar and Orozco Ibera, etc. This has never been published. In spite of the fact that I had roamed all over the world to find photographic material for my book, They Came Before Columbus, I was not aware of this until about a year ago. Do you know, we do not know where there, this head is now. It has been removed from its place in Tresapotes. It's supposed to be in Tuxla. We have to search for it. We do not know its exact location. We think we know the state because Heiser said it's in Tuxla, but we haven't found it yet. This is the first head. It was 10 tons in weight, just the head, you know. Now nowhere, nowhere, nowhere in America before this period, and we'll say what the period is because we have been able to get datings. Nowhere, even though the Americans were masters of portrait art, and we have, perhaps no people have left so many records in stone and clay and gold and copal of their faces as have the Americans. There are about a million pieces left in America of the faces of the people who lived there in many historical periods. This is unusual in American art. It is colossal and it is just a head. That's very important. You find that when you go into the great African world, the enormous 
statues, you find the colossal heads, etc. And it's not, I'm not talking about an art style. Look at that face. They say, it looks, the reason why it has a puff nose and puff lips is because it's a baby face. <laughs> That's one of the explanations. That one may sound funny. You haven't heard it all yet. Let's see the other head. Next. Okay, that perhaps looks too like a baby. What an unfortunate baby. <laughs> Go on. Now you're seeing a range of heads from the various sites, Naventa, Tresapotes, San Lorenzo, you're seeing the various heads. And one of the things you note about these heads, apart from the unusual combination of the broad nose, extended nostril feature, the full lips, etc., you note they have a helmet. Only one of them is without a helmet, and that one, when I went to Villa Hermosa with a team of 40, and those of you who are interested, I will comment on that in question and answer time. Please step, tell me about it because I took 40 Americans with me to visit the archaeological sites in Mexico where these things are found. I took them in July. The Acnefer Society, um, which is run by Dorothy Anderson, who is here today, um, organized it. And we spent about two weeks in Mexico going through these sites. And there is a figure which I will show you shortly which has disappeared. They said that they took it away because the weather is damaging it. It's been standing 3,000 years in the weather. You know. <laughs> Suddenly, like King Tut, it has become too delicate. Okay. Go on. These are just a panorama of the heads. Now this one I want you to look at closely. Here, in perhaps the best preserved of all the heads, you see very clearly the type of helmet being used. These people say it's a football helmet because I suppose they think that that is the way they will explain it. That's not a football helmet. Okay, that is a military helmet. At Tanis in the Egyptian Delta, we have found helmets like that. Now, there are a whole range of helmets used by Egyptians and Nubians and people in the Nile Valley over the many millennia, or, or rather the many, the, the 3,000 years of Egyptian rule. But in this period, this is one of the types of helmets used. This is a military period. I will deal in a moment, as I say, with the nature of that period, how we arrive at the Bacon. But I want you to see the heads first. And I want to explain how they explain the heads. Okay, go ahead. Here again you see it. Now leave it there and let me tell you how this has been explained. First they said they looked like babies. Then they said the reason why it has that peculiar mouth is the snarling mouth of a jaguar. Now look at that, you know, this is a jaguar. This is supposed to be a werewolf, a human jaguar. Explaining this monumental sculpture. Now it is true that the Olmec were obsessed with the jaguar. It was a sacred motif among them. It was a living thing. It prowled on the edge of their, their settlements and on the edge of their consciousness. But they have distinctive things in which you have the jaguar, in which you have the human type jaguar, where the jaguar and the human is fused, and then you have the realistic portraiture. When the Science Digest in 1981 did an article on me, in which they tried to show that the establishment had been extremely unfair to me, dismissing my evidence, they pointed out when they asked Michael Coe, who's supposed to be the great expert on Mexico, ancient Mexico, they said, what do you think of Van Sertma's suggestion that these are Africans? He says, no, 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 the reason why they have broad noses and full lips is because the tools were blunt. <laughs> now look at the blunt, look what the blunt tools made. And when, when, the, when the aquiline noses appear, or the different type of nose from that appears, the tools were sharpened. <laughs> this is the 38-ton head carved out of pure basalt with a blunt tool, standing here after 3,000 years staring at us as if we're looking into a mirror. And this is the blunt tool pro product of the Olmec civilization. Whenever facts cannot be dealt with, they have to be dismissed. I'm going to show you quite a number of these as we go on. But how did they date these heads? How could they arrive at the date? It is impossible to date stone 
You can date stone, yes, you can say, well, this is millions of years old, but to date it into historic context is impossible. So how did they arrive at the dating? Fortunately, at Lebento, which is known as the holy capital of the Almec world, this first major American civilization, they found four of these stone heads rooted in a wooden ceremonial platform where the Native Americans worshipped. And it was inextricably linked to the platform. The platform had been reconstructed to accommodate the heads. Hence, a dating of the wood of the platform could yield a dating of the heads. And that dating was 814 plus or minus 134 BC, which is anywhere between 948 and 680 years before Christ. That is the carbon dating. Now, let us go on to deal with some more heads, and I will come back to that in a moment, and the significance of that, those dates. Go ahead. Now, this one has disappeared. This one is too delicate to remain where it is. The weather has got it in. Okay. and welcome to the second part of our series with Rutgers University anthropologist Dr. Ivan Van Sertema. Dr. Van Sertema, author of They Came Before Columbus, The African Presence in America, continues his discussion of the African presence in the Americas before Christ. Now let me come to the meat of the subject, which deals with the Olmec, O-L-M-E-C. It was a hundred years ago in 1858 that some um, Peasants and trust supporters discovered a huge stone head. Now I want the slides to go on so you can see the area I'm talking about. And when I speak of Mexico, please understand, I'm not talking of the shrunken Mexico of today. I'm speaking of Mexico when it was the center of the American continent, at least the North American continent, when it stretched as far as La Plata in Canada, when it included parts of Texas, California, Colorado, etc. So that when one speaks of it, don't just push it off the map and say Central America. It was America. It was the center of the first American civilization. Now let us have the first slide. There you see the area I'm speaking about. In that diamond or basin, that, that basin where you see those little diamonds, those little black diamonds, there is where at La Venta, on this side, at Trasaportes and at San Lorenzo, they found a number of huge stone heads. But the first head was found in 1858, and I want to show you what they saw in 1858, more than a century ago. Next. This is the head. This head was dug out of the earth in 1858, and I, this is the face. Let us look at the side. This is the side. Let us look at the back, and note now the back. Do you know that this photograph has never been published in any book, not even in mine? Do you know two young black anthrophoto journalists, Wayne Chandler and Catherine Gaynell, showed me this last year? It blew my mind. <laughs> this photograph is hidden in the files, hidden in the posthumous files of Heiser. It's a photograph showing you what the head looked like when they found it. Yet the National Geographic, which is so remarkable for authentic presentation of what it finds, did not think it necessary to show these braids. The Mexicans then started to talk about Africans in America before Columbus, Jose Melgar and Orozco Ibera, etc. This has never been published. In spite of the fact that I had roamed all over the world to find photographic material for my book, They Came Before Columbus, I was not aware of this until about a year ago. 
Do you know we do not know where their, this head is now? It has been removed from its place in Tresapotes. It's supposed to be in Tux, but we have to search for it. We do not know its exact location. We think we know the state because Heiser said it's in Tux, but we haven't found it yet. This is the first head. It was 10 tons in weight, just the head, you know. Now nowhere, nowhere, nowhere in America before this period, and we'll say what the period is because we have been able to get datings. Nowhere, even though the Americans were masters of portrait art, and we have perhaps no people have left so many records in stone and clay and gold and copal of their faces as have the Americans. There are about a million pieces left in America of the faces of the people who lived there in many historical periods. This is unusual in American art. It is colossal and it is just a head. That's very important. You find that when you go into the Af great African world, the enormous statues you find the colossal heads etc and it's not i'm not talking about an art style look at that face they say it looks the reason why it has a puff nose and puff lips is because it's a baby face <laughs> that's one of the explanations that one may sound funny you haven't heard it all yet let's see the other head next okay that perhaps looks too like a baby. What an unfortunate baby. <laughs> Go on. Now you're seeing a range of heads from the various sites, La Venta, Tresapotel, San Lorenzo. You're seeing the various heads. And one of the things you note about these heads, apart from the unusual combination of the broad nose, extended nostril feature, the full lips, etc., you note they have a helmet. Only one of them is without a helmet, and that one, when I went to Villa Hermosa with a team of 40, and those of you who are interested, I will comment on that in question and answer time. Please step, tell me about it, because I took 40 Americans with me to visit the archaeological site in Mexico where these things are found. I took them in July. The Acnefer Society, um, which is run by Dorothy Anderson, who is here today, um, organized it and we spent about two weeks in Mexico going through these sites and there is a figure which I will show you shortly which has disappeared. They said that they took it away because the weather is damaging it. It's been standing 3,000 years in the weather you know. <laughs> Suddenly like King Tut, it has become too delicate. Okay, go on. These are just the panorama of the heads. Now this one I want you to look at closely here. In perhaps the best preserved of all the heads, you see very clearly the type of helmet being used. These people say it's a football helmet because I suppose they think that that is the way they will explain it. That's not a football helmet. Okay, that is a military helmet. At Tanis in the Egyptian Delta, we have found helmets like that. Now, there were a whole range of helmets used by Egyptians and Nubians and people in the Nile Valley over the many millennia or rather the many, the 3,000 years of Egyptian rule. But in this period, this is one of the types of helmets used. This is a military period. I will deal in a moment, as I say, with the nature of that period, how we arrive at the date. But I want you to see the heads first. And I want to explain how they explain the heads. Okay, go ahead. Here again you see it. Now leave it there and let me tell you how this has been explained. First they said they looked like babies. Then they said the reason why it has that peculiar mouth is the darling mouth of a jaguar. Now look at that, you know, this is a jaguar. This is supposed to be a werewolf, a human jaguar. Explaining this monumental sculpture. Now it is true that the Olmec were obsessed with the jaguar. It was a sacred motif among them. It was a living thing. It prowled on the edge of their, their settlements and on the edge of their consciousness. But they have distinctive things in which you have the jaguar, in which you have the human type jaguar, where the jaguar and the human is fused, and then you have the realistic portraiture. When the Science Digest in 1981 did an article on me, 
in which they tried to show that the establishment had been extremely unfair to me dismissing my evidence. They pointed out when they asked Michael Cole, who's supposed to be the great expert on Mexico, ancient Mexico, they said, what do you think of Van Sertma's suggestion that these are Africans? He says, no, 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 the reason why they have broad noses and full lips is because the tools were blunt. <laughs> now look at the blunt, look what the blunt tools made. And when, when, the, when the aquiline noses appear, or the different type of nose from that appears, the tools were sharpened. <laughs> this, is the, this is the 38 ton head, carved out of pure basalt, with a blunt tool, standing here after 3,000 years, staring at us as if we were looking into a mirror. And this is the blunt tool pro product of the Olmec civilization. Whenever facts cannot be dealt with, they have to be dismissed. And I'm going to show you quite a number of these as we go on. But how did they date these heads? How could they arrive at the date? It is impossible to date stone. You can date stone, yes, you can say, well, this is millions of years old. But to date it into a historic context is impossible. So how did they arrive at the dating? Fortunately, at Levento, which is known as the holy capital of the Olmec world, this first major American civilization. They found four of these stone heads rooted in a wooden ceremonial platform where the Native Americans worship. And it was inextricably linked to the platform. The platform had been reconstructed to accommodate the head. Hence, a dating of the wood of the platform could yield the dating of the heads. And that dating was 814 plus or minus 134 BC, which is anywhere between 948 and 680 years before Christ. That is the carbon dating. <laughs> now, let us go on to deal with some more heads, and I will come back to that in a moment and the significance of that, those dates. Go ahead. Now this one has disappeared. This one is too delicate to remain where it is. The weather has got it in. Have a look. Some people have called this the siren pose, but have a look. This is 800 years before Christ in the heart of America. These are a range of the heads. Von Wutenau has arranged this, and you have a range of these heads circling a king of the 25th dynasty. That is within the range 948 to 680 BC. In fact, the 25th dynasty is at the lower end of the range. But you do have Nubico-Nubian -Libi um, dynasties ranging from around um, 1000 BC going down where you have the African figure still in a state of dominance, um, controlling the armies, etc. And you, this has been presented because von Wutenau is presenting here an inscription on a self at Leventa, um, which has been deciphered by Professor Winters in Chicago, Clyde Ahmad Winters, and he claims that these symbols are Manding, and he gives a translation of the Manding symbols. He's done this with two selves at Leventa, and this is being presented to show that apart from the physical presence that you do have markings which indicate that people are coming in here using a different script. Let us go on. Now this is very interesting. This again was discovered, um, it wasn't discovered, but here again discrepancies on a forgery was brought to my attention by Wayne Chandler and Catherine Gaynell. I hope in the question and answer time they may have a chance to show you how many things were changed. This is what it appears now as, a square earring, a different type of nose, a different type of lip, a different type of beard, etc. And its original form, next slide please, in its original form, this is how it appeared. It has been changed, the round earring has been made square, the figure on top has been altered, the nose has been changed, the mouth has been changed. Go ahead. Now we come to the terracotta. People have said, I've tried to explain the stone heads. They say, well, really, you know, there are some Asiatics who look like that. So some of the heads 
may be put in question because some of them are clearly African, some of them are, look like a mixture of African Asian, some of them may be Asian. But why shouldn't they be? I never said that all mixed civilization was a black civilization. I never said all mixed civilization was an African civilization. I said that we have hard evidence that Africans came into the Almic world, infiltrated it, and left their mark and influence on that civilization, a profound and seminal influence, and that you find a number of their heads, a number of their representations in the priest caste of the Almic. Obviously, that Almic caste also included the Asiatic types, because the Native American was an Asiatic, largely. He came out of Asia. We are talking now not of the beginnings of America, we're talking about the beginnings of American civilization. Okay, you please make that distinction. The beginnings of things have nothing to do with the beginnings of civilization. That is why I'm not very impressed by people telling me that the first man was an African. That doesn't prove Africans were in Egypt. We have far more significant proofs because Egypt is millions of years after the first man. So the civilization in Egypt has nothing to do with the beginnings of man. That's the beginnings of a major human civilization. And that we were able to establish at this conference is clearly and unmistakably African in origin and inspiration. But do not mix the two things up. Millions of years passed between those periods. What I am saying here, and I repeat, is that we have hard evidence, not only in stone, but in all forms of material, that you have a major African presence. Now people could say, okay, what you have here is the imagination of the artist. No, sir. There are things here that you have to watch. Though you have a certain stylization here and not photographic realism, you have an emphasis on a certain kind of nostril and mouth. You have an emphasis on coloration because they could have used all types of clay. When they're representing a type with this type of hair, they use a darker clay. So they're, they're evoking not only features, they are evoking a coloration of skin and they're evoking a texture of hair. I don't know of the Asiatics with that type of hair who do not have African blood. And these are the things you have to watch. It is in these details like the key. Why do we use stone sculptures? Why do we use terracottas to recover history? Because history is not only recovered by books. Europe has been extremely fortunate as a result of its invasions and as a result of the fact that in spite of the great wars, its archives are intact. It is not true as many people believe that those are the only archives that Africa had none and America had none. America had thousands of books. Only three survived because Bishop Lander, among the others, who came here said, burn them all, they're works of the devil. As a result, all the libraries in America were destroyed. There are only three books surviving, and they're not even here. There's the Codex Dresden and the Codex Madrid here in Spain and Germany. Our, even the American history is so scattered that when I was doing the came before Columbus, I had to pay the Germans, note, I had to pay the Germans $2,000 to reproduce these heads, not this, the stone heads, because they had the best photographs of the stone heads in Mexico. I had to pay the Russians $150 to reproduce a black king, Tahaka, because I could not find a Sudanese looking Tahaka in the British or uh, Paris museums. Whenever something was very black in Britain, it went into the back room. If it could not be established clearly that it was a slave, <laughs> these are terracottas. Now look closely. The tremendous effort. I have held these things in my hands. The effort spent in trying to evoke a texture of hair very different from that of the Native American. Continue. Continue. Here is an African acrobat. This is before Christ in America. Look again at the texture. This is an African woman at Shoshipala. This is all Olmec influenced historical period. Now this is a mixture where you have the African and Native American apparently fusing. Go ahead. Here again, possibly a mixture. 
This is a black woman at Teotihuacan. Now Teotihuacan is later than the Olmec period, but it is an, a, a place in Mexico where the, great, the, the greatest of all pyramids in America lie, and she is found in the pyramid of Teotihuacan in the heart of America. And Teotihuacan was around the birth of Christ. It is also an Olmec influence. Well, they say that these are people who came from Tamoankan. These are the priest castes of the Olmec who spread out as the Olmec world died out. And there you have, she has two faces. On the other side is a man and on this side is a woman. And this, this, as I say, is in Teotihuacan. Next. Okay, well, before I come to deal with how they came here and why they came here. Let me say something else. Apart from the stone heads and the terracottas, there are the skeletons. Professor Werzinski, who has, who is from the, from Poland, a skull expert from Poland, Andres Werzinski, showed that when you went to the dry areas of this Olmec civilization, they found African skeletons among the priest caste. Now how can you tell an African skeleton? They were telling it all the time, you know, until they found it in the wrong place. <laughs> he has correlated the distances between the features and the various structure like the nasal ridge, the brow ridge, the nasal index, the structure of the jaw, and so forth, the way it juts out and so on. He has correlated that with, with skull types you found in Africa over a range of African types, and he finds this type distinct, physically distinct from the native, predominant native type in the Olmec world of the time. And he finds it not only like that, but at a certain point he finds a male African lying beside a female Asiatic or Native American. They begin to intermarry because they haven't brought enough women they begin to intermarry and they begin to fuse into each other so that at another stage, at one stage, the ratio is 13.5% in the priest caste and it drops to 4.5. He has done very detailed studies, very detailed studies about this. Where on earth in archaeology could you find a corroboration of stone figures representing a physical type Terracotta representing a certain physical type and skeletal evidence representing the same physical type and you say it doesn't exist, it's in the imagination of the artist. In other words, the artist went and cut the skulls in the ground and shaped them to look like they're terracotta. That's really what you're saying. Utter absurdity. And then people say, ah, but Van Sertima, even if you find these types, you have to bear in mind Africans do not have boats. They don't know anything about rivers and oceans. How could they cross the Atlantic? It is absurd. You can't cross the Atlantic. Before the Europeans came, there were no proper boats to cross oceans. Let me say something about that. First of all, there's an enormous ignorance about boats in Africa. The Africans created at least seven types, seven different types of boats on the Niger. They created about a dozen types of boats on the Indian Ocean, and they created about 20 different types of boats on the Nile. No people have as long waterways and use waterways and have used waterways in ancient times as much as the African. The Niger runs 2,400 miles. Their map showing how the various rivers linked up. The Africans used boats in many areas. When the Portuguese attacked the Africans and the Gambia, boats came out with 120 men on board. You can't put 120 men in a canoe. <laughs> in the 13th century, the 13th century note the Chinese noted that Africans had brought elephants to them in ships across the Indian Ocean. You can't put an elephant in a canoe. In fact, I would like to see elephants on the Santa Maria. <laughs> there are noted of Arab ships, ten times larger than anything Columbus or Vespucci sailed. And it's not only a question of size, 
Many mariners have pointed out that a small boat even without sails can cross the Atlantic. There have been 120 experiments, 120 experiments since 1920 alone establishing the capacity and potential of small boats across the Atlantic. I have spent three weeks on the Atlantic, three weeks on the Atlantic, from Venezuela going into the Caribbean and crossing over into part of Africa and going up into Spain and coming down into the British Isles. Three weeks. And I never saw a storm in those three weeks, not once. The Atlantic is not what it is thought to be. The Atlantic, for most of the year, is peaceful. Apart from that, there are currents in the Atlantic that automatically take anything that falls off Africa and brings it to America automatically. There are three currents like that. Look up the United States Oceanographic Survey if you think I've made up my map. I'm taking it from the U.S. Oceanographic Survey. There's a current off the Cape Verde where the Africans were trading. There's a current off the Senegambia coast. And there's a current off the Southern Africa that takes you automatically into America. Anything caught in those currents has to come to America unless the fish gets it first. Now look at these boats. This so-called dugout, which they have concentrated on, is a merely a building block, a basic building block or template for expansion and extension techniques. Let me go now quickly to show you some types. This is a canoe, but it's carrying three camels aboard ship. It's not the sort of thing that Tarzan he turns over in the movies. <laughs> go on. This is a ship, an African ship on the Indian Ocean, centuries before Christ. It has its sail, as you can see, it has a cabin above, and we even have holes, the cargo in the hold, etc. This crossed the Indian Ocean. Then you have one that is very famous, the next one. Most of you know of this. This is the Ra One. Africans built this ship. This ship has no nails. It is built of papyrus reed, Hyadal got. Africans in Lake Chad, the Baduma people on the Abdullah de Jibrin, to rebuild a ship which was used centuries before Christ. It is not their most efficient ship. In fact, it is among the most primitive ships used by the Egyptians and Nubian types. And yet they were able to cross from Africa to America successfully. In 1969, this boat set out from Safi in North Africa, which is far from the currents I speak about. The rudders broke on the first day. Note, the rudders broke on the first day. They couldn't steer to America. Their knowledge of America didn't help them. The Atlantic Ocean took the boat and brought it to America using current power. Hans Lindemann and Alain Bombard in separate experiments crossed the Atlantic and African type boats. Alain Bombard did a miraculous thing. He not only went in an African dugout, which no African would be mad enough to use to cross the Atlantic since he had other boats, but he not only took a dugout, he took no oar, no sail, and no food or water. He took an African fishing kit, and when rain did not fall, he couldn't catch it in a scoop or a dipper, he caught the fish, and he squeezed the juice out of the fish. Everything moves on those currents. Driftwood, fish, birds, trade winds, everything. They knew nothing about these currents and many accidents occurred and this is probably began, probably began as an accident as all so-called discoveries in America were accidents. Columbus had no intention of coming here. He thought he was going to India. That is why this place was called India. It wasn't called America. This place was called India. That's why natives are still being called Indians because we are the Indians he found in the West. Good evening and welcome to the final segment of our series with Rutgers University anthropologist Dr. Ivan Van Sertima. Having discussed the African stoneheads and African terracottas of the ancient Olmec civilization, Dr. Van Sertima moves on to African cultural features that show up in ancient America several hundred years before Christ.
Now what were the motives for these people coming here? You have to understand what was happening between 948 and 680 BC. There were three main factors. First of all, the Phoenicians. Now I know I'm running out of time, but I really have to finish this. I'm sorry, this is too important. First of all, the conditions of the world at that time, there was a tremendous search on by the Phoenicians, and by the way, the Phoenicians are not a race, they are black Phoenicians, they are Semitic Phoenicians, they are white Phoenicians. Phoenician is purple, the purple people, the people searching for purple. Purple became as, as great a treasure as gold. Margaret Hanke has recently, recently done a thesis on purple showing that it, it cost four million dollars to, to buy a yard of purple cloth at a certain point. It had got so far. Just the same kind of madness that drove the European here searching for gold when he thought he was in Marco Polo's territory, the great dreams and visions of Marco Polo, is the same madness that brought purple people, the so-called people searching for purple. They found cochineal, which is Native American purple, in caves in North Africa. Pre-Columbian, pre-Christian. So don't, first of all, there is the accident which occurred, occurred because there were armies and armed navies moving up and down the Mediterranean. The Syrians had blocked off the Egyptians from the Red Sea. They blocked them off from all trade in the East. The Egyptians even traded as far as Hawaii. They found the Egyptian scripts in Hawaii. They blocked off the Asiatic ports and the Egyptians, the Nubians were forced and the Phoenicians were forced west to the Mediterranean where they started searching for new sources of tin. They were mining tin up in Cornwall in the British Isles around 800 BC. They, also the Phoenicians, some of them had fled and started into mixing and intermarrying with blacks in Carthage. We have a range of types intermarrying there. By the time of Hannibal, they were largely black. The skeletal evidence is shown as numismatic evidence is also shown the coins with the African elephant on one side and African faces on the other. So there were all sorts of things that brought people in towards the Atlantic area. And accidents could occur, as has occurred so often time, bringing them into the Gulf of Mexico because that's exactly where they're found and that's exactly where the currents end coming in from Africa. It comes into the Caribbean and it comes into the Gulf of, in, into the Gulf of Mexico. Now, when I was last in Mexico, it was pointed out to me that there was a Comal Calco pyramid and there were blocks and bricks on that pyramid showing inscriptions in Egyptian and in Libyan and in Punic, which is a Phoenician, and there were ships drawn on the bricks. This is a recent discovery, only a few months old. And an archaeologist who was in the room at the time told me he'd been sent out to check certain structures at Quintana Roo, which is not far from Comal Calco, and found there were ancient lighthouses guiding ships coming in, both river traffic and possibly ocean-going ships. We have to look again at that ancient world, and apart from the physical evidence and the capacity and potential to travel and the, and the dynamics of the situation that made people move into this area at that time, there's the cultural evidence. And I want to show some of this very quickly now. Give me another 10 minutes and I'll wrap this up. These are the currents I talk about. Go ahead. These are the rivers that link Africa before the coming of Europe. Okay. This is a map found in Africa in 1513 showing they knew the connections between Africa and America. This is the Piri Reyes map. It shows the correct latitudinal and longitudinal coordinates between the African Atlantic coastline, the South American coastline going up in, into the Caribbean, into the Gulf of Mexico. How on earth could anyone draw that map? Europe could not draw that map, although in 1500 Cabral had come to South America because no European mastered latitudinal and longitudinal coordinates until the 18th century. This is a fact. Columbus himself said in his diary, I have eight or nine pilots aboard the ships. And yet, I am not sure my pilots are so ignorant. I am not sure I can find again the lands I have discovered. They could not plot latitudinal and longitudinal coordinates. This is the most accurate map drawn. It is found in the Sack Library of Alexandria. Our books were burnt and destroyed, just like in America. In the same year, Columbus sailed 84,000 manuscripts in Arabic, written by blacks and Arabs, 
Well, some of the Arabs were black, some of them were not. 84,000 manuscripts written in Arabic, scientific and historical documents were burnt in the spears of Granada after the Palestinians defeated the Moors. Just as the, the libraries of Alexandria were sacked many hundreds of years earlier. This survives, however. These are currents again. And let me go to some of aspects of the cultural evidence, the impact. Now look at this. This is the first platform in America, in American civilization, where the Americans worship. On those slabs you see like arms, four of the stone heads with African type features appear. And for the first time in America, note, for the very first time, both the true pyramid and the step pyramid appears. These guys have no evolutionary, here in America, the Native American has no evolutionary step to the pyramid. Suddenly, full blown, here is the pyramid. Here is a true pyramid made out of clay because they didn't have enough stone to make a pyramid out of stone. So now it's eroded, but it's still standing after nearly 3,000 years. And it is three and a half million cubic feet in volume. It was taken 18,000 men, one million man hours to construct. There it is standing on the step pyramid. The miniature step pyramid is right there. Who spent many centuries developing this and have a long evolutionary record of it, the Egyptian. Suddenly it's appearing here, full blown, without antecedents. True, in the later stages like a Teotihuacan, Africans didn't build the pyramids here. I'm not saying that, I'm saying they influenced its ideas, certain principles, certain relationships, certain structural relationships, certain functions, like the tomb, the temple, and later on the Great Pyramid, the, the astronomical uses, etc., the movable capstones and so forth. This has been established, people say, for example, oh no, the pyramids in America are step pyramids and those in Egypt are only conical pyramids, not true. The Egyptians began by building step pyramids and even when they built true pyramids, x-rays have shown the steps inside. They covered up the steps. The steps are inside. The, the steps are the score of the pyramid. So that you have a lot of inferences, both functional and structural inferences in that pyramid which appears for the first time here and is carried forward by the Almec even onto Tihotihuacan. Continue. That is the remains, the ruins now of the pyramid. And because it's made of clay, you could see the breakup occurring. Now they're saying, no, it's not a pyramid. They're not even pointing out this is clay and not stone. Hence, the erosion could cause those um, undulations. They say, no, it's not a pyramid. It's a fluted cone. I wonder what they built a fluted cone for. Go, go on. Here is the double crown. Here are some cultural features. Now, one of the things you note about the Olmec, the crook, the flail, the double crown, the use of purple. They found the knockout codex with all the noble women wearing certain purple skirts, the noble men and the priest caste having certain elements of purple, just as in Egypt, it was a sacred color and it spread through the Mediterranean as a result of the Phoenicians. You find a whole range of these things occurring. Why are the priest kings of the Olmec imitating the Egyptians in so many respects? They must have an artificial beard as an index of their royal rank. They must, some of them have double crowns, which is unusual. Nowhere in the world except in Egypt do you have the double crown. What is it for? They have the plume serpent. That doesn't belong to them. The jaguar is their motif. How come after a period of time, the jaguar in a transitional phase begins to sprout a serpent's tail and, and, and feathers begin to grow? instead of fur on his paws. And then suddenly the jaguar disappears and the plume serpent becomes a motif of American civilization as it was in ancient Egypt. All this is supposed to be coincidence. It suddenly happened like that. Go on. Now look at the plume serpent element. I want you to note this. Look at the bird and the serpent and King Tuck. Go on. And the earring as well. Look at the earring again. This is in, in America before Christ. There is the serpent, this, this, this barely survived, you see the serpent head there, and you see these birds. Move now to the Mayan, where it's carried forward. There is the snake in the front, and there is the bird behind, around the area. The bird, bird, and there you see the three together, 
They have undergone certain changes because they're moving from one culture area to another. These people are not imitating slavishly, but they're carrying these major elements on their crowns. They're carrying these symbols and these ideas because they've been affected from outside. And you find other gods, you find the god Sokar. He's standing on a snake with two heads, the head at the tail and the head at the head. Nowhere in the world do you have a man standing with wings outstretched on the back of a snake with two heads. When you go to Zap in Mexico, there it is, a man standing just as in Egypt on a snake with heads on either side with wings coming out of his arm. You go and you see the god Aken in Egypt, he's swallowing a rope. He has no proper um, facial features and he has a double rope. You go to Mexico, there's him swallowing the double rope. He has no distinctive facial features. You go and you look at their rituals. You find opening of the God ceremony. I'm going to show you this. Go ahead. There it is. In Egypt, there's a snake-headed stick. And there's a strange instrument there. And the priest has an animal skin and the tail between his legs. And there's this um, person um, sitting on kneeling beside him. And he's just is opening of the mouth ceremony. There again in Mexico, there is the priest with the animal on the tail between his legs, the snake headed stick and the other instrument. And there is the guy um, kneeling there with the little beard, etc. And they're performing the ceremony. Go ahead. Now this brings up a new question. This is a script found in the Caribbean. This is not BC, this is AD. But I bring it here because this is something I discovered and it was it was deciphered by Fell in Harvard and later, later by the Libyan Department of Antiquities. It is it is established to be a pre-Islamic script that were used by Africans, one of their several scripts. Africans created at least half a dozen scripts. They're not people without writing as you've been led to believe. This is written in a rock in an ancient waterfall, but I bring it up because I want to relate it to something that was found in an earlier period, the Egyptian script found in America at the Davenport Stella, and note this, they said it was a forgery, note what was found. They found the Egyptian script and on one side the Libyan script and the Iberian Tunic script, all three together in a world in America, duplicated as it was in, in the BC period when you have the Phoenician, the Libyan, the Egyptian scripts being brought together and they're saying the same thing. They said this is a forgery. How could it be a forgery in 1874 when in 1874 nobody could at that time decipher the Libyan or the Iberian Tunic? They could only decipher the Egyptian. And here it is, found in America. They have found the hymn to the Aton in the American cave. They have found the Micmac engines, a branch of the Algonquin using Egyptian hieroglyphs. And when I confronted Dr. Thompson, who had done a book on the Micmac, I confronted him in Arizona, and he said, no, that is a fake. I said, Dr. Thompson, I have the fakes with me, the so-called fakes. Since you are a master of Micmac, and you also know Egyptian, please show me which is true and which is fake. That I don't want to enter into that. And someone from the audience said, show him Dr. Thompson, show him. <laughs> he had quite a discussion that day. Because they were not only said it's an accident, I said if it were an accident, how come true accidents can occur in scripts? Because there are not all that many signs in the human world. I could use a sign and you could use a sign, but why use the same song for the sign? Why have the same meaning for the song and the sign? And why have a whole ring, string of things like that related to each other? Then comes the problem. You can't just say it is coincidence. These are intimately connected. You go to the vocabulary in astronomy of one of the American tribes and you find 80% of the words in astronomy have Egyptian songs. Identical meanings and songs linked to the same astronomical objects. And, uh, and astronomical um, discoveries. There again you, you find also, and let me close now by pointing to other things they have found. They have found paper made from wood pulp in the Olmec world at Elvia John. Nowhere on earth was anyone making paper from wood pulp at that time except in Egypt. The Chinese were to do it later. Everybody was who was making paper, we were making paper from papyrus reed or something like that, so were the Egyptians, but they also had paper from wood pulp, and you find a piece of paper made from wood pulp at El John in the Olmec world. Heavy transport techniques, Heiser, 
who was a great diffusionist, I mean a great isolationist, he attacked us in the last years of his life. He began to discover things that blew all of his theories away. And he noted the heavy transport techniques of the Almec were identical with that of the Egyptians as well as their agricultural system. The levees they used and the various kinds of hydraulic systems and so forth were identical with the Egyptians. All right, in the agriculture you could say they're facing the same problems in the heavy transport techniques. They were doing something suddenly moving 40 ton stones from quarries 80 miles away down river. And they were solving problems in heavy transport techniques the heavy transport techniques that the Egyptians have been working at for, for many centuries. Go on. Okay, that's the um, slides for now. Let me close by making a point about new discoveries. We have found the god-headed, the dog-headed god Anubis at Palenque in Mexico. We have found a new stone head which was um, presented in March, a new stone head with African type features at San Lorenzo. We have found a whole new range of things. This is an ongoing subject, and with each new day, something else appears that establishes with greater firmness and conclusiveness the meeting and melting of cultures and civilizations on this continent, particularly the impact of Nile Valley civilization, of Egyptian civilization, and the first major and formative civilization in America. There have been attempts to dismiss me. The New York Times ran a three-page attack on me when my book came out in 1977. And the man who wrote the attack has never visited any archaeological site in America or in Africa. He just happens to be the Walt Disney professor in archaeology at Cambridge. But when I was attacked, there came to my aid a remarkable man, Dr. Clarence Wyant. He was the first man to go down into this area. He went, he was the first man to write a PhD for the Smithsonian on this subject. He wrote about the terracottas at Tres Supporters. He was sent out by Matthew Sterling. He was his personal assistant. And he showed me in his book, he said, look, Look at the African heads here, look at the African terracottas. And I said, but Dr. Wyant, why didn't you say in your book they were African? He says, I'm not a fool. I wanted my PhD. You see what's happening to you? Half a century later. And he's not dishonest, he's just speaking a truth. To establish these things, to look again at the history of America and Africa is absolutely necessary. We cannot go to the archives simply as in Europe. Therefore, we cannot use the same standard historical methods that are used in European history. Because in Europe, if you want to find out something that happens a thousand years ago, you go to the archives. You can't go to the archives in Africa and America where it is destroyed, but other archives exist. Every major event leaves a mark in time. 